another, another busy, busy week ahead. ahead. Uh, but, but we're, we're kicking, kicking off the week uh, with, 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 a, with a great format here with two very distinguished panelists that I'm just honored to be on the stage with and introduce today. So this session today on strategic leadership, our objectives are to understand the critical role of leadership in confronting the changing complex African security landscape, to analyze the tenets of an effective strategic leadership in an African context to highlight the importance of adaptability for effective leadership in the ever-changing and complex security environment, and to examine the role of strategic leadership and security sector leaders in the development and implementation of national security strategies. Now, as I mentioned, we have two strategic leaders, distinguished gentlemen that I said I'm honored to be with. I've known these men for a long time. Uh, I respect them very much. And I'm so happy we can have them here today to share with you their experiences and their insights. First, we have Lieutenant General retired Clement Namangali. Clement Namangali is a diplomat and the former Malawi Defense Force Deputy Commander. And he retired with the rank of Lieutenant General in 2020. He is currently the Deputy Permanent Representative at the Malawi Permanent Mission to the United Nations in New York since February 2021. As a career soldier and an academic, General Amagali has vast experience in multinational operations at the strategic planning level, and has frequently served as a key facilitator and panelist for seminars on national security policy, conflict management, and civil military relations. Within the Malawi government, he served as the vice chair of an interagency task force which drafted their national security policy, the first of its kind that was launched in 2018. As the Southern African Development Community co-coordinator for the Interstate Defense and Security Committee, General Mamangali was among the group of experts who drafted and produced policy documents and roadmaps for the establishment of the SADC standby force and he represented SADC at the African Union to operationalize the African Standby Force as a response tool of the African Peace and Security Architecture. General Namagali holds a Master of Science degree, degree in Global Security from Cranfield University in the United Kingdom, a Master of Science degree in Strategic Management from the University of Derby, also in the United Kingdom, and a Master of Arts degree in International Studies from the University of Nairobi. He also served as a senior lecturer at Mizuzu University in Malawi and was among the first lecturers to stand up the faculty of the Mizuzu University's Department of Governance, Peace, and Security Studies. General Namagali has authored several papers and is a regular panelist on emerging threats and conflict management in forums. Currently, he's Malawi's Deputy Permanent Representative in New York where his representational, representational duties of diplomacy involve dealing with a wide range of complex issues, politics, international security, humanitarian and economic challenges with even a broader perspective. So I think you'll agree, we're very fortunate to have a man of his qualifications and background with us here today. Also joining us on stage is an old friend of the Africa Center, although not old, just with us for a long time, General Biram Yap. He's a military advisor in the Department of Peace Operations at the United Nations. He was appointed to this role by United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres in 25 May 2021. General Yup has over 30 years of military experience, previously serving as the Chief of Defense Staff of the Senegalese Armed Forces. Prior to this appointment, he served as National Security Advisor to the President of Senegal. General Yup was also the Chief of Staff and then the Deputy Chief of Staff of the Senegalese Air Force. As a pilot in the Senegalese Air Force, he's accumulated over 7,000 flying hours. General Yup has studied at the Royal Air Academy of Morocco, the University of Southern California, the Air University in Maxwell, Alabama, and the College in the Army of Paris. General Yup is a scholar and a practitioner who has worked for many years with the Africa Center for Strategic Studies as a facilitator and a speaker in a wide range of seminars. 
He was, he was a, a fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy at the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson, Wilson Center, where he conducted, conducted research on Sub-Saharan Africa's security sector reform. Jeremy Yup has published several articles on strategic airlift capacities, security sector reform, civil and security sector relations in Sub-Saharan Africa, and national security and rights information. He's a doctoral student in diplomacy and international relations at the Center for Diplomatic and Strategic Studies in Dakar. This man has more energy than anyone I've ever met. I think, I think you'll agree, agree. We're, we're very fortunate and we're blessed, blessed to have two old friends and colleagues with us today. I'm honored, honored to be here. Jim, Jim will be up if you would please start us off. Thank, Thank you very much, Dan, for this very generous, generous introduction. introduction. And, and you know, know I was saying in the bus, bus that sometimes, sometimes you know, you can be very shy. shy. And, and you, <laughs> you know, when people, people talk about myself, uh, it embarrasses me a little, little bit, but, but uh, it, it does not take, take too long for me to get over it. So, so thank, thank you very, very much for these very, very kind words. I am very, very happy to be here, here at my, my home. I was saying in, in the, the bus that, that ACSS clearly, clearly has widely contributed, contributed to what, what I am today. And, and that, that is why, despite my, my very tight agenda, agenda I managed, I managed to, to come, come here against the view of my cabinet because they thought that I should be going elsewhere. But it was very important for me to be here to thank you for you, what you have done for me, but also to have the opportunity to interact with the younger generation and learn from them because it's also part of my responsibilities to listen to the, the younger generations, generations so, so that, that we can integrate the views in what, what we are trying to do to promote peace and stability throughout our continent and set the conditions, conditions for development. development. So, so thank, thank you once again for inviting me. I cannot start sharing my remarks without saying Good morning, Good morning to my good, good friends, friends, facilitators. I have worked extensively with who are my brothers, my sisters, and I'm very, very happy to see them here. And I wish them good luck and thank them for what they're doing for ACSS and for the world in general. Uh, I did not know what I was supposed to be talking about. Uh, but in, in the bus, and after, after having exchanged with Dan, and, and taking into consideration the fact that I have, have in front of me those who will be taking over, inshallah, in the, the near future. future. Those who will be responsible at the, the highest level of undertaking the development of our, our continent. continent. I decided just to share with you what, what I consider as being the basics for anyone who would like to be an effective leader. A leader who can promote changes in his or her institution and or in his or her society. But before doing that, I would like also to share three considerations I think are important to bear in mind. First one is that, in my opinion, there is not a universal one-fits-all definition of a good leader. Depending on where you are, you can be considered as a good leader. But if you leave where you are and you go somewhere else, you might be considered as maybe a different person. So there is not one fits all definition of leadership. Even if there are many values that tend to be recognized as very important values 
almost everywhere in the world. This is one consideration. The second consideration, in my opinion, is that no leader will be considered unanimously as a good leader. Some, Some people might consider you as a very good leader, while others will consider you as a wise. And also with time, you can be on a given period of time considered as a very good leader, and with time, the perception of people can change. So if you take these three considerations into account, I think, I think you, you need, need to be, be very humble. humble. So, so humility is extremely important. You, you cannot be an effective leader without, without being humble. Just, Just understand, understand that human beings cannot be perfect. They have their strengths and their weaknesses. weaknesses. Now, beyond, beyond these considerations, it is also important, in my opinion, to recognize that nowadays we are in a world that is extremely complex. In a world where things can change very drastically in a very short period of time. In a world where things are extremely ambiguous and very difficult to understand. In an environment like this one, one needs to make sure that he or she does everything that is necessary to have a good situational awareness. It's key. The situational awareness is the foundation of whatever you need to undertake. Situational awareness means understanding the politics of your institution, how your institution works. Situational awareness means an understanding the economics of your institution, your resources, the funds that are available. Because funds are very important for whatever you want to undertake. The situational and awareness means that you need to understand the social situation of your institution. The interaction that is going on within your institution, meaning also that you need to understand and identify the opportunities that are given to you within your institution. What are the strengths, the weaknesses, the threats your institution is facing? And this is irrespective of the position in which you are. So situational awareness is the foundation of whatever we would like to undertake. And for the military people, if you remember that the philosopher Sun Tzu has said very clearly that before going ahead and undertaking your activities, you need to know what is going on. You need to know your environment, you need to know your people, your friends, but also your enemies. Nowadays, we are talking about situational awareness. Nothing should be left aside. If you miss something, it can backfire sooner or later. So let us work on a good situational awareness. And this will constitute the foundation of the implementation of your vision. One cannot pretend to be an effective leader without a vision, a project. A dream that, that is realistic, that is adapted and in coherence with your situational awareness, with the realities of your institution. A project with benchmarks, a clear roadmap, you can on a regular basis assess and evaluate. Without a project, it is impossible for you to pretend that you should be recognized as an effective leader. 
but, but your, your project, project once again needs to be realistic needs to be in coherence with the reality of your institution need to be adapted to your challenges so that you can explain this vision to your people because a good vision that is not shared with your colleagues, your subordinates, cannot be implemented in the best conditions possible. Because there won't be an ownership. People cannot own things they don't understand. People cannot own things they are not aware of. So let us work on a realistic and coherent vision, but let us make it known by our colleagues, our subordinates. And if it requires further explanation, let's take time to explain it. And then we have a collective project. We can together, as a team, try to implement. Today, more than ever, it is clear, given the complexity of the challenges, the acuity of the challenges, we need, we need many heads, not, not one. If you don't have a strong team, there is nothing decisive you will be uh, undertaking, nothing. So let us create the team spirit. And for a team spirit, people need to understand. But once they understand your projects and you have their buy-in, you need to go further and create the human conditions one needs to create for the team as a family to work hand in hand to make sure that the project is implemented. And then for that, and I talk by experience, you need to respect your colleagues. Respect is at the epicenter of whatever now we do, irrespective of the rank of the position of the age. You cannot work with people and expect to be successful if you don't respect people. You need to respect your subordinates, and your subordinates need to respect you. You cannot have the human environment that can help you implement in the best conditions possible if you do not make sure that your people are in good working and living conditions. That is key. There is a strong link between the quality of the living and working conditions and the performance of any entity. So, so let's take time. Let's put in place the necessary measures so that we make sure that our people are treated decently with respect. They are in the basic living and working conditions. If you do that, your people will know that you care for them and they will care for you and for the entity. Extremely important. Pay them well, put them in the right conditions, they will take care of the mission. In addition to putting them in this decent human condition, let us make sure that whenever they have been able to achieve something we find positive, we appreciate what they have done. So appreciation and recognition of what people have achieved is also extremely important if one would like to have a team that is successful. Appreciation. We do not appreciate enough. We are more critical than appreciative to what our people do. There are so many studies that have demonstrated that people like to be appreciated when they have been successful in their job. 
Now, you, you cannot, cannot have these conditions, conditions if you do not listen to your people. Listening is being very challenging nowadays. We tend to speak more than we listen. And listening is key. Your people, they need to be convinced that they are listened to. So please, let us take time to give time to our people to express themselves and to contribute to the decision making within our institution. And also, an effective leader is a leader who is able on a regular basis to challenge his subordinates. It is proven that people they remain in the institution why, when they have the conviction that the institution is not an institution that is kept into routine, but rather it is an institution that is always challenging them, always giving them new goals to achieve. So challenge your people, but also mentor your people. The mentorship is extremely important. Your people, Your people need to know that when they are facing difficult situations and they don't know where to go, they can count on you because you have the knowledge and you also have the experience. And you cannot challenge your people if you do not have the legitimacy a leader should have. Legitimacy requires hard work. It requires exemplarity, not perfection, because none of us is perfect. But you can be exemplary in the way you behave and also in the way you treat your people. Together, we are always stronger. Let us remember that. It's not about one person. It's about a lot of people. It's about a team. It's about a family. And also, let us be conscious of the fact that we are not in our positions forever. We are in our positions for a short period of time. So let us be in a hurry to do good things so that we can have a legacy because only our legacy will survive us. We will go, we will be replaced, but what we have been able to achieve for the good of our people will remain, remain forever. forever. I, I will keep it here, and, and we will be more than happy to respond to questions and, and to listen to also comment. Thank, thank you very much. General Yap, thank, thank you very much for those remarks. Now, now over to uh, General Amagali, please. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, we are here for a reason, of course, but, but uh, I have been told what, what we were supposed to do, to do and listening, listening to my colleague here, Jeremy, I would, I would have said, what, what are your questions? questions? Let's get, get it on. on. And, and we'll stay, stay here two, two three hours, hours with what, with what he, he gave you. But, but uh, uh, because I'm here, I'm here, let me throw, throw a few things, things that people of your level can, can appreciate and probably take, take something when, when they leave this place. place. Now, now, I was, I was told, told to share some, some of my experiences, whether in uniform, whether, uniform, whether as a diplomat, and whether as a human being, what, what you need, need to do to succeed in life as, as a leader. Most, Most of, of these, those that are academic, I'm not, not going to go deep down with them because, because you know them. them. Don't even bother taking, taking notes, notes if you don't think you are. The slides that, that I prepared, some, some of the issues, issues just, just last, last night, night when, when I heard what I was supposed, supposed to be doing, I will leave, leave those that are innocent knots, but they're not, they're not very comprehensive, and you can, you can use them if you want to. But suffice to say, having been, been, been in the military for over 30, over 30 years, years, I now, I now can speak from different, different perspectives, whether it's tactical, tactical level, operational level, or strategic level. And, today's and today's topic is about strategic, strategic leadership. leadership. It, it means, means the one, the one that, that can stand the test of time, time at least, least, if you can, can, 
it must, it must be broad, broad as, as my colleague, colleague has mentioned. mentioned. Situation of awareness, awareness because, because if you don't, if you don't do, that, do that, you, you are, are on your own, own. you live in the past. Even doctors who were very, very good in the 60s, 60s can never, never be good today because, because there are certain challenges, challenges in the diseases, diseases that are coming up. You are not there. There's there's no no COVID COVID there was no COVID in those days. There was no Ebola problem in those days. They have to keep constant with that. What more with the leadership? It means you've got to do more. But suffice to say, since the majority here from the military, and I only removed my uniform about two years ago, let me say this and you're going to understand me and all those academics and civilians and diplomats who are here. In the military, if there's a profession that is well-groomed and very professional, highly disciplined in any country, it should be, it should be the military. military. Now, I know you have examples of the bad military or poor regular armies all over Africa that are causing havoc. And this is the medicine we are trying to prescribe today. It will, it will not be eurosacrosant, but then you will know what it is. When, when I was, I was in the military, I had a couple of colonels in my office, brigadiers, you name it, sergeant majors. And, and if, if I, I had to do something, it was simply colonel, colonel of an ICU office. office. By, By tomorrow morning, I want a one pager of an analysis on Ukraine. Ukraine. No, no questions answered. And, and tomorrow, tomorrow I'll get it. it. That's how beautiful the military is about all these things. Now, where I am, I've got to be careful. I'll start. Colleague, do you think you can give me a pager and probably, you know, if, if you, you don't, don't have, have any problems problem. there. Totally, totally different world. Totally, totally different world. Give you a chance, I would have taken the first option. And, and this is the nature of the job that we have. So, so my, my colleague, colleague mentioned about context, situational awareness. If you go with the context of your countries, of your situation where you're coming from, these could be different. That will help you a lot. Because, because those who live in North Africa, Africa probably from, from my big world, and those of us who live in South Africa, we've got, got some cultural differences, differences that, that nobody can change, change overnight. And, and all these play our factors. factors. And, and talk about politics. Oh, oh yeah, you, you know how politics has influenced the way we live in Africa. Africa. So, so mark, mark the first bullet, bullet there, there, which says context. context. But, but I will not bore you with defining what the strategy is. But, but mention a few things that, that you know can be of help to you. Can I go, go to the next slide, please? Like, like I said, in the military, it's always command. command. And, and when, when you look, look at command versus the management of day-to-day -day -day life, they are totally different. But the end state would be probably the same. So, so those of us, of us who are in the business world, or, or the, the corporate, corporate world, we love to use management because that sorts out a few things. Those of us who volunteered to fight for our own countries, to die for our own countries, would rather go on command. And no matter what depending on what gives you, command is the real concept that works very well in the military. So this is a totally different thing, but you want to win the battles because you use the command, and, and command, command simply helps, helps you because if you make it as an emerging leader at a very different level, whether the platoon leader, whether the company commander, whether the brigade, and what call it, whatever it is, they'll give you an influence that goes with command. In other words, in command, you have the influence, you are the trainer, you are the judge, and of course, you are the teacher. So all these are embedded there, making it easy for you. In, In other words, words, if you're born very shy, shy like, like we used to be, I'm no longer shy now, I'm not, not, not even fearing. It's because of what I've gone through. But, but they, they made me that. I was a boy like that. that. They, they help, if you're a sergeant, you're gonna talk like this, like that, like that. If you're a platoon commander, you're gonna talk like this, like that. In the military, and anywhere else, they, they don't, don't ask you whether you feel like going for a morning run, okay? The language is not, do you think like you can go for a run today or how do you feel? No, 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 no. You, you just, just say 5.30 tomorrow on the road. 
And those who are patriotic will usually go through this and enjoy it, and you enjoy it, and the leadership goes through that line. The other side of the story, context. I have to be careful what I'm talking. When I'm with the peers in New York, I don't speak like this. It's always, Your Excellency, do you think we can discuss about Ukraine over a cup of coffee? And, and you, you have, have to be, be careful, careful. situation awareness, awareness because I'm living in, in a totally different world. Let, Let me have, have the other side very quickly. quickly. These ones are just cherry picked and put them there. But don't worry, I just want to make a quick comparison before I go to the gist of the matter. The military uses high, high structure, I mean, hierarchy. 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 People have argued in books and stuff like that. You can read about this. They think it's a draconian or something like that is very, very regimented. It doesn't all. But I'll tell you, after living in the military for over 30 years, this is the structure that is best suited for war. If you have got to win battles, this is the structure. But in companies, corporates, and some of you probably have got some businesses, then you can go with the line managers, doing your management and stuff like that. Military stress on orders. The corporate world has got rules, but if you don't fix them well, they can go on the street and even march against you. In the military, you don't do that. Of course, we've got bad examples where the military has marched somewhere. Those are for us to learn from. But in the military, we use a lot of intelligence. Without intelligence, no operation succeeds. And my guys in uniform, shake your heads, yes. Without good intelligence, everything else is useless. The business world is going to use the same. They call it the business analysis, corporate analysis, you know, whatever it is, but the end goal has got to be reached anyway. In the military, we like recognition. And recognition, yes, you have to be proud of it. That's why we have medals, we have ranks, and stuff like that. And I'll tell you from an African perspective, if anybody does something beautiful and something heroic out in Africa now, jumping back home, not many, not many are happy if it's not monetary attached. If you give them a medal, like the Americans do, and I'm not saying because of, I'm here because I was trained with the American military and I've lived here with a couple of courses, the medal, you can keep it for recognition, even your sons, daughters, next generation. I've got to be proud of it. But I leave it to you whether the Africans would love to have money, which they can share and build houses and forget about the next generation. That type of recognition is a weakness if you go on those four lines back home. And when I say back home, I'm talking about Africa. I'm representing you all. Welcome to reality. Now, we use things like of patriotism, in the business world, you wouldn't find a lot of this. Because the nature of what we do has got an effect on the people. You've got to be patriotic and you've got to take an off. It's not just a job. And when you need this off, left and right, whether you're a general, whether you're simply a military you know, personnel just joining, they want you to have a little bit of sacrifice. Not a little bit because you can even sacrifice your life. And, and what, what a great owner, noble job, job that anybody can have than to satisfy their life. That's, That's what military is all about. Civilian world, you've got contracts, oh yeah. And, and they've got clauses where they say, if you don't follow this, well, you're not paying us. You're going to have this sort of punishment or, you know, topas uh, major or whatever it is. That's the civilian world. But we're all looking for the end state. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm not, not going, going to bother you with this how strategy is crafted and at what level. But, but let me uh, rush to the next slide. That's the civilian world, but I just want you to compare the two, the civilian world and the, uh, the military, or the security sector, where a lot of discipline is required. Next slide, please. I will not bother you with this. Please don't worry about this. You've seen this several times. But suffice to say, Traditionally, the, the word strategy, strategy comes from the military. military. All of you know about this, I know. So, so when, when you talk about tactical level, operational level, level, and strategic, there are well regimented steps that we've got to achieve goals for. Is your target or objective at a tactical level? Is your mission as a leader at a tactical level? 
are we just part of the bigger picture? Because you have to look at the bigger picture until you go to grand strategy and things like that. I'm not going to bore you with this. You can look at this on your own. Same thing here with those colors. Let me go to the next one. Now, I'll dwell on this, and I'm not going to dwell on the others that probably you will know about them. I was just listening last night so that they form the basis for our discussion here. And the thought is not that good, but when I was in my room, I thought I was doing a good job. I should have had my secretary, or if it was a staff officer, I would have done a good job. You have checked three times before giving it to me. That's the beauty of the military. And I would just come here and go ahead and read. Because I was doing it alone, mm -mm. <laughs> so not a problem with this. But let me go to the first one, terrorism. You all know about terrorism, but I'm not going to bore you with the details, the concepts, the radical frameworks, why, why this happened, why that happens. But for Africa, a few countries which had experienced terrorism are finding out, and all of us are finding out, that we have not dealt with it already, and it is expanding. To, to such a point that, that even in Southern Africa, Africa for, for example, Mozambique, and I think my good friends from Mozambique are there, Cabo de Gado, now we are taking the focus from the Middle East to the North Africa, to the Central Africa, we're talking about the South Africa. Is it a big challenge? And the answer is yes, just shake your hands, yes. Do we know how to deal it, to deal with it? And the answer is no. Oh yeah, we love after the operation, for the us, the academics to sit down, which things did we do well, which things did we not do? But the million people and the leadership on the ground have got to deal with it as it happens or as they are there. We have the benefit of doubt because we can say, what went wrong in Afghanistan? And the Americans went a couple of years ago. Oh, no, no, no. They should have done an exit plan. Sounds good, doesn't it? You go on the ground, whether you're from Laos or from Africa, if you're in that same situation, the toughness of it comes there. And I just wanted to emphasize that Africa is having its share of terrorism. On this Africa, I point to this library. They're not in any particular order. They're traditional threats. I'm not going to mention about those. You deal with those every day, and you have scenarios of those. And then I'll put another one. Very unique ones. I'm saying poverty and hunger. Now, now it's easy to understand these things probably at this level. When I was joining the military myself, and I'm airborne and stuff like that, trained in the US, all I liked was to jump into tanks, armored cars, a deuce and a half, get to a, you know, an objective, come back. And I thought, if there is anything else, I have nothing to do with it. But believe you me, Poverty is, is a driver of insecurity. Poverty right now, which is rapid in Africa, and I'm not giving you examples, can be a source of conflict. In other words, if I'm going to talk to the Malay government at this level, if they tell me they're going to buy maize or corn and the Americans will pronounce it, I mean, it will determine it. I understand that the system of food in Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and most of your countries. If a Malawian doesn't eat, you of course need security in his mind. And they can do anything. They can go on the street. They can do anything. There'll be a lot of crime. And for you to get the nexus between the two, it becomes difficult. Now from the poor country, or from the country that are challenged, if they are gonna ask me, do you need a tank? Or do you need maize? At that strategic level, you should be able to say no, maize, despite your uniform. Are we together? We are having problems of hunger. A hungry man can do anything. Those of you who are here, oh, you want to do a little bit of faces. And those of us in Africa, we have seen what hunger means. You have seen emaciated bodies in uh, whether Somalia, Ethiopia, or Canada, those other areas, and the much of it, whether tangible or intangible, in the whole of Africa. A few countries can go through that. And when you have a hungry nation, you are seeing 
for a crime of need as the general security special would be. That's a crime of need and you have to correct it if they ask you about the intervention, you just have to think about that. Let me just share a, pic, a few on that so that we can discuss later probably and give time to questions. We have an issue of migration. I'm going down the other. Migration is a headache to ourselves and not to our colleagues, the next day as well. I don't go, I will not go to the details. We'll discuss this. But we are having, we are becoming a bother to other nations and they are becoming a bother to us because of migration. Is it from hunger? How did you control those such threats? Next, please, next slide. Very quickly, challenges in Africa. Please just read down those, then we can discuss later on. Poor governance in Africa, oh yes, a lot. In Africa, you know, some of our leaders can wake up one morning and they decide to defy their own constitution. They'll go for three times, four times, all these are what factors to play with. Ethnic conflicts. Multinational companies in Africa, the conflicts that are in Africa, some of these areas, if you go, you find that multinational companies have got a stake to, you know, to, the, to the situation. But because I don't have time, let me say, if you look at that and you've got a question, we'll discuss later. Next slide, please, very quickly. Where for? I've listed this one, but we can cover these as we go along. But mark my words. I'm saying the first one, professionalism. There are certain things people in the military can do or at that level can do. I've seen now that business is sprouting up in Africa. People in uniform can go on a business. They become corporate managers as well. If you ask me, do you do business, that type of management of business in the military? My answer, no, they don't go together. Sorry if some people have got businesses, but I can explain all day. I'm here for two days. We can discuss that and I can give you examples. Let's go to the next one. I've taken this picture deliberately. I'm saying, saying collective security. This is the way to go and we're going in that direction. And SEC is trying hard to work on that one. Many countries are doing that. I took an innocent picture because I'm there when I was in uniform. The other general thing is from South Africa, and the other one I think is from Tanzania, and behind there there's somebody from Botswana and the other countries as well. Uh, I'm trying to show that collective security perhaps is the answer when you really understand where you're going and what you want to achieve for Africa. Next, just these pictures, we can talk about them later on, but uh, that's somewhere I was. Next, next. Now, next, I'm saying building partnerships. Now, I just put this picture deliberately because partnerships are strong in nowadays peacekeeping, PSO, and the general would tell you. But those partnerships, they come with their costs as well. And I'm going to mention this. For example, those of us in Africa, majority of us, we rely on aid, donations, and stuff like that. If you, if you come, come to, to some, some of our countries, we do not have the resources that the Americans have. In, in other, other words, you, you find that you put an air force, force that has got all French aircraft. So just give you an example. Your logistics, you've got all the vehicles that are coming from Israel. From Israel. And, and you've, you've got, got some AK-47 that are coming from Russia. Russia. Then, then if, if you, you look, look at, look at the, the other side, side, then you have probably the Chinese supply some other things too. If you look at those, as a headache, as a leader, you see how difficult it is when those things are no longer usable because you've got to depend on somebody. Next, please. I'm done. And I'm saying, as an individual, like the general said, be humble, respect your colleagues, respect those above you, respect those who are older than you, and have the situation awareness. I think he took my words out and I will. What we have, we can have people who just talk, 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 without following by action. You are saying, follow your action, I mean, follow your decisions, or your talk with actions. And it needs a lot to have the situation awareness, do the right training, and be able to lead in the future. I'm resting my case, but let's picture, please. I hope I can do the best. Something where I can start from. Thank you, yeah, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, generals, both of you.
So, so excellent, excellent way to start, to start this uh, conversation now with, with our two distinguished colleagues on strategic, strategic leadership. leadership. I, I, I was particularly uh, struck with uh, the, the fact, fact that General Diop started with, with humility. And it is impressive the linkage between humility and situational awareness. Because if, if you're not humble, humble you, you can't, can't seek knowledge. knowledge. You, you can't, can't understand your environment because you think you know it all. So starting with humility, critically important for strategic leadership and leadership in general. And then he finished with respect and the linkage there with humility. If you're not humble, it's difficult to respect others, listen to others' opinions. So such a key aspect of, of leadership that you don't hear that often. But it's so critically important to every aspect is the humility. So thank you, General, for pointing that out. And then General Magali, a lot of uh, similarities, obviously, because these are both uh, distinguished strategic leaders, very successful in their career. But the idea of needing to stay current, to grow with the role that you're in, not rely on your past knowledge, so important, and the ability to adapt. And I think the key thing that struck me from General Magali was the fact that as you, As you become, become a strategic, strategic leader, you, you have, have to deal with complex challenges. When you start out, you're dealing with simple challenges. And there's an analogy we use here at the Africa Center, and forgive me if you've already heard it during this week, but we define challenges and problems as simple, complicated, and complex. And a simple challenge would be baking a loaf of bread. If you have the recipe and you have the, uh, the right tools and oven and ingredients, you, you can, can bake a loaf of bread. bread. It's a pretty simple challenge. A complicated would be building an airplane. That's complicated, but if you have all the parts, you have the tools, you have everything together, you could build an airplane. And you could do it with the instructional manual and with all the parts necessary to do it. But a complex challenge is raising a child. And anyone here who's a parent, you can get all the books you want. You can bring in the best experts. You can do everything they say, and every child will turn out differently, even within your own family. And I'm living proof of that with three children. And so there's no recipe. It's a complex challenge. So what do you have to do to solve complex challenges? You have to be humble. You have to understand the environment, the situational awareness. You have to stay current as the child grows. It's all about strategic leadership. It's the complex challenge. And I think our panelists brought that out today. And so that's what you are going to be faced with. Uh, maybe uh, now, maybe you're now you're dealing with complicated, complicated problems. problems. As you, As you continue to advance your career, career they're going to become complex. complex. So you need to be ready, ready for those. 